Jonathan Demme is widely regarded as one of the leading directors in American film. He learned his craft making B-movies with Roger Corman in the early 1970s. He made his feature directorial debut with Caged Heat in 1974. In 1991, he broke into the mainstream with his first blockbuster, Silence of the Lambs. The film took home five Oscars, including one for Best Director. His current film, Beloved, is an adaptation of Toni Morrison's Pulitzer Prize-winning novel. It stars Oprah Winfrey. It marks his first return to the director's chair since Philadelphia in 1993. I'm pleased to have him at this table at long last. Welcome, <laughs> sir. Thank you it's very much. It's great to have you here. And congratulations on Beloved. Thank you. Um, we talked to Oprah, which will be on later this week, and, and we talked a lot about, in a sense, the making of a film. Um, when you saw the script, what was it that so emotionally grabbed you to say, this is for me? You know, what, what I remember so clearly is I picked up the script, I started reading it, and at about page 30, 32, something like that, was the scene um, that takes place in the clearing when baby Suggs calls the men and the women and the children come out of the woods. And I found myself with tears running down my face at this imagery, at the, at the, the thoughts and feelings that the, the descriptions evoked. And I thought, um, I don't know where the script is headed because I hadn't read the book, but um, I love it. I, I was already, I've never been so completely hooked and seduced so early in a script in my life. And so what happened then? Well, I finished the script and saw that it was um, arguably the, uh, the opportunity of a... Of, of a I, f I feel it's the dream I never dared have come true. It's a movie that combines a lot of my, my favorite genres while addressing thematically stuff that's just been you know, tremendously important to me for a long time. What are those, what are those things that appeal to you in terms of the genres that it, that it touched, that well, gave you an opportunity to deal with? Um, I guess ghost, a ghost story. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, and then a, a movie that, that dealt in dream time, um, yeah. which I loved, dreams and nightmares. Um, I've always wanted to do, I think most filmmakers want to do their western. Um, I haven't done mine yet. And <laughs> when I started picturing this farmland and, yeah. and the people on horseback, it's, it's kind of, it's a Midwest western, but it's yeah. also a chance to get into a period that I've always adored in motion pictures and never had a chance to work with. Directors want to do westerns because it's so uniquely American, I guess. Well, you know, as a I, for me, that was the first genre that I ever fell in love with. I guess I guess um, westerns and horror movies, and uh, uh, just the whole idea of guys galloping up on horses and leaping down and, and pulling their their six guns out is kind of a very stirring thing for a, a, a kid. And um, it it kind of uh, that which makes you fall in love in the first place is something that that kind of uh, stays with you. When you read the script, did you think that Oprah wanted to be Seth? I figured she must. <laughs> I figured she'd be nuts if she didn't right. want to play Seth. Yeah, she, whatever else she might be, That's right. smart she is. It, it didn't come uh, with, with any kind of um, uh, articulated attachment like that, but uh, I made that assumption. Uh, and you were prepared for that, or did you have to see her, meet her, talk to her, decide if she was up to it? You know, it had been so long since Oprah had done a movie, and she has done so few movies. And since her last movie, she's become such a, a gigantic American figure. Icon, um, almost. I, uh, definitely a living icon. Um, for all the best reasons, by the way. I've been a, a, an admirer. I wasn't a devotee of the TV show. I saw some of them, but I was usually you know, at work when she was on. But I understood where she was coming from, and I'd seen enough of her to really have tremendous admiration for her. But I did have the concern that regardless of how, how good a job she might do on the part, and I think, again, you had to assume she'd do a good job, um, could we as consumers um, accept um, Oprah Winfrey as a 19th century farm woman ha literally haunted by her past. That's the first thing I talked to her about when we met. And um, she convinced you or you saw something that convinced you? Well, you know, I thought I'm going to be like a real kind of grown up, almost business person yeah, and talk right. to my potential partner here in terms right. that, that are appropriate and say, do you think that's a problem? Um, and um, she, whatever it was, I don't remember exactly what she said, but I know within about 90, six, I was, 90 seconds I was going, that was a stupid question. <laughs> it's no problem. She st I got immediately into talk um, on two levels. One, why she as a person felt that Beloved um, was such an important, valuable, um, rich kind of uh, piece of material to make into a movie. She also talked about how she was going to attack the part and how um, she feels a very, very strong 
connection with her ancestors, not just her familial ancestors, but her, her racial ancestors, and how she intended in bringing Seth to life to draw upon these forces. And I was really taken with that. The, the memorabilia she has and, and all of the things that she, the voices she might hear about connections mm -hmm. with slavery. Mm -hmm. She talked at great length about um, Margaret Garner, yeah. who of course is the woman whose tragic real, real life, life experience. Real experience is the basis for Beloved. Yeah. And incidentally, I don't know if you've seen this new book called Modern Medea, which is a semi-scholarly but very gripping, actual, nice, thick reportage of the Margaret Garner story um, itself, which is I've just begun and is quite amazing. This is a book or is this yeah. you know, not a documentary film but a book? Right. Okay. Take a look at this. This is Oprah talking to us last Friday about you. This is a conversation that will be on this program this week. Roll tape. Jonathan leaves me and says, trust me. And the interesting thing about that, Charlie, is that there had been other directors in this 10-year period. All Everybody says, trust me. I think it's a Hollywood thing. Yeah, right. You leave the meeting and they say, trust, trust me, okay. trust me, yeah. trust me, be okay. I'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. Listen, <laughs> That's right. it'll be fine. So, it'll and be every fine. single time that happened, I would leave the meeting and I would say to Kate, my producer, I'd say, what do you think? <laughs> What do you think? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. Was she okay? I don't know. What do you... And the, the difference is when somebody says, trust me, and it's right, right. you don't have to ask anybody. That uh, Jonathan was at my house when we had that meeting, and he got up to go to the bathroom down the hall, and Kate and I were sitting at the kitchen table, and when he left, we went... <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it, it. Yes, we danced. We call it our Jonathan jig. <laughs> he comes back in, and we're like this, sitting yeah. at the table. The interesting thing, too, is that... Um, he didn't say yes immediately, but it looked like it might be a yes. And the next day I called Kate and she said, dare we hope that yeah. life could be this good. <laughs> dare we hope? I said, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. It sounds like it's going to be a yes. And once he said yes, things started moving immediately. Trust. Now you said to her, <laughs> trust me, trust me. Meaning what? That Charlie, I, I think what I, actually, what I hope I actually said was, <laughs> you realize, Oprah, that you will need to trust me. Oh, I see. <laughs> so you a little bit a variation of what it is that they say so. too often. I, I think that um, that um, I, with someone who's who's taken on such, so many responsibilities for herself as Oprah has, right. and has you know tremendous burden of of responsibility, a burden of last wordness. Um, I just wanted to 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 make sure that she knew number one that she would need to trust her director and I guess I wanted to reassure her that that I felt she could trust me that um, that I wouldn't let her down yeah I don't think she's done that very much my impression is rarely does she do that and she literally put herself in your hands because the way you evolved the film and in a sense convinced her was a little bit different than what she had in her mind according to her yes well, you know, it's it's different from what I had in my mind. Um, it's it, so I, I I assume so. I don't know. I I talked to Oprah um, on Sunday, yesterday. Yeah. And I called her up because um, I had gotten some phone calls the night before. I heard some messages from um, some family and friends across the country who had seen the picture and had some things right. to say that moved me a lot. Yeah. And I wanted to call her up to to tell her. And we found ourselves just talking about how. Um, at this point, there is a complete absence of the, the woulda, coulda, shouldas. For better or for worse, however the picture winds up doing, however far it reaches, um, uh, I, I wanted her to know that I was completely happy and thrilled with it. And um, I was really happy to hear her come back and say that she wouldn't change a, a thing in it. So um, it's great that... It ends well, regardless yeah. of how much money it makes, regardless of how many people see it. For you and for her, you made a movie that you want the audience to experience what? To know what? To... <laughs> um, well, you know, it's funny because uh, we were out there before coming inside and I was talking to a couple of people who had seen the new Roberto Benigni movie. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> just for the light, it's called A Beautiful Life and it's about using the Holocaust as the background for a family uh, as a father tries to help his child come to grips with the Right. Horror. And um, the gentleman I was sitting with said that he and his wife had seen it and had adored it. Um, and I told him, I heard myself saying that I had seen the trailer for it several weeks ago and it looked incredibly beautiful 
and it looked incredibly moving to the degree that I was a little bit afraid of it. Um, I was afraid of the potential emotions that, that just the little hints I saw in the trailer. It just looks like an extraordinary movie. So um, I found, to, I suddenly went, hmm, and yet this is what I'm, I'm hoping people will, 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 what people's experience will be when they see Beloved. I want people to be tremendously moved by it. Um, the kind of moved that, that maybe you are a little afraid to get to. Um, this, it's such an incredibly powerful story that, that, that Toni Morrison was inspired by in real life and went on to tell and, and create this, this amazing piece of fiction. And it's, it's, it, just, uh, it doesn't pretend to not want to grab your heart and just um, pull you this way and that and, and, and just really move you to the degree that you come out arguably feeling a little bit different um, about, about, uh, about, about things. It changed Oprah. Did it change you? Very much so. Very much so. It's, it's incredible because, again, you know, um, this is a great, great American book um, about things that are, are as important as, as anything, um, uh, I think, in, the, in our country today, in the world today, and, and, and what I'm referring to is really um, uh, racial harmony um, versus racial exploitation. Um, it's, it's, about, it's about humanity and man's potential inhumanity to man and man's potential showing of humanity to man. It's, it's really, it is about that. Now, it's dressed up in a wonderful ghost story. Um, and with and even there's there's a there's a horror film um, in Beloved as well. There's there's sequence. I mean, I I did Silence of the Lambs, and there are scenes in this movie that that I think are are you know equally as horrifying. Um, and I think the suspense in this movie gets to a point to be as intense as anything I've ever been involved with. Um, and it's just a, a very very rich aggressive. Um, it it makes demands of an audience, and um, I feel that it it, it has the ability to provide rewards consistent with the demands. But it's it's something that that like me with this Roberto Benigni movie, I know that I've got to kind of gear myself up and, and kind of you go and you're going to pay money to go cry somewhere. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like it's a strange dynamic. When you thought about doing this. Um, there was not anything you wanted to do it and you had been looking to make a film about race because it is so central to the American dilemma and so central to what you're concerned about. Well, I, I, um, you know, I, by the way, I, I had, there was a time when, when, uh, as a moviegoer, um, where I was getting fed up with the absence of, of sort of African American stories and African American presence in movies, I, uh, it's it's such a big part of our of our life here in America. Um, how come it's not represented more in movies? And I was I, I, nothing against you know white people movies. I love them too, but I was just sort of uh, as a consumer starving for more variety um, and more 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 contact, more more uh, insights, more more involvement. Um, and uh, we, our company, you know, looked around and tried to find some stuff. Now, meanwhile, in fact, well, I, I read the script for Boys in the Hood. Yeah. Um, and I read and I went, oh, my God, I would love to make this movie. And we called up, um, we were involved um, with uh, uh, Sony at that point, And we called up and arranged for John Singleton to um, come to New York to talk to us to see if, if he would um, let us, uh, uh, my partner and I, Ed Saxon, make Boys in the Hood. Now, but by the time John got to New York, he had made his directing deal at Columbia yeah. to direct it, <laughs> and he came in anyway, and we had a great time. And uh, I, I reference that because um, John especially, I mean, Spike Lee certainly um, uh, uh, put the news out there that, that African Americans could make fantastic movies that could also make money. Um, and that's what gets movies made more than anything. And I think that John Singleton um, kicked the door open a lot wider as well. And suddenly, it seemed, there was, was a, at last a really thrilling wave of African-American directors, men and women, um, making a, a wonderful, diver everything from uh, mindless, delightful comedies to serious stuff to penetrating uh, uh, studies of what's going on today and it was uh, suddenly the screens were starting to come alive with african-american Im imagery as well as euro-american imagery and i think that's great um, so anyway the the sort of the the um, the 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 desire to be part of that as a filmmaker um, i guess was there but i wasn't really pursuing it anymore 
that's why to have this script come on. I care so much about about um, race because I feel that um, um, our country can get better and better the more we are able to transcend our tortured past and and aspire aggressively towards a harmony. I think you know the the, the synergy that's that's possible is amazing. I also think the inverse um, is is our one of our greatest greatest threats. And the films can play a role because of their impact on the culture and helping us come to an understanding of how it divides us, an understanding of how if we can get inside our hearts, maybe we can step forward and get closer together? Yeah, and I, I don't think I could say it any better than that. I know myself that I have, have um, either through books and occasionally through films, I have had um, light bulbs go on in my head, and I've been able to, to expand my view um, of, of others and, and, I guess, even of myself and, and of our potential. And um, the funny thing is that, that, that if you start thinking that, that, like, I don't think that Beloved can have an impact on the way the country views race or views our, our shameful, um, uh, uh, tragically ignored past of slavery, but I do think, and I know that the movie can change um, you a little bit, or, or uh, someone here or, or there. Oprah, or you. Well, yeah, and, and folks that I'm seeing coming out of the movie theaters and, and, and talking to. So individuals um, can, can have their, uh, their thoughts changed about, about things from movies. Um, and I, th I think that you know, we need, that's why we need movies that, that aspire to turning on light bulbs and books that aspire to turning on. And the, the trick is to make them really entertaining in the doing. Boy, you said it there, because there is this notion that, that the public doesn't want to see. There is the notion, at least. And hopefully you and others, and Stephen and others, will prove them wrong that the public doesn't want to see that. That's not what they necessarily want to see. And there's some risk in the energy and the money to make movies uh, not knowing if that's where the public appetite is. Mm -hmm. You felt that responsibility. Uh, clearly, Oprah said to me, you know, I know that this is a risk. I know that they're looking to this as a test. Can we make a film that's good, that's entertaining, uh, that in a sense touches all the points that we want to touch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, people, you know, we're, we're all, we're out of school now and we're not going to go to the movies to, to pay to get educated or what have you. And right. I, you know, we pay to get, to get an extraordinary experience, hopefully, or either on one hand or another. Um, you know, we pay our money to, to have a, a, a dynamic thing happen to us in there, either to, you know, to laugh and have a certain kind of thrills, like yeah. my son and I did at Rush Hour Friday night, which I loved. I don't know if you've seen that. No, but I know about it. And that yeah. is so, you know, that's the, the, the Press and Surges Sullivan's Travels. There's no greater gift that a filmmaker can give an audience than a laugh. And it's true. Yeah. God, we need laughter. Um, the part where, where, we, where we aspire to move people and um, and through the emotions um, create a, you know other consciousnesses. Uh, you know it's it's funny because I've had some people say to me um, about Beloved. You know, um, is is this supposed to make white people feel guilty by evoking um, the ghosts of slavery? And uh, nothing could be farther from the. the Truth for me. I mean, it's it's. I think if anything, it's a, it's an it's an invitation to be liberated to a certain extent from from um, the kind of denial that I think um, a lot of us are are burdened with. And it is also a way to say that slavery and other experiences in America, whether which we ought to better understand, can best be understood by the fact that they are a million individual experiences of what individuals went through and the passion, the passage that they had to take. Charlie, that is so exactly what I love the most in a way about this movie because I don't know where you went to school. I went to public school on Long Island and then in Miami, Florida. And the history books that we had when they dealt with American history, um, civil, there was slavery. It didn't go into uh, the human terms of slavery. It was a fact. It was almost kind of mythological. It was slavery. Yeah. Um, a certain kinds of archetypal imagery. It was a bad thing that happened in America. Yeah. That was about it. And, and then Lincoln freed the slaves 
Um, and then, then sort of, we cut to the next, like maybe the Spanish-American War or something in 1896. That's an exciting, dynamic, white army, American kind of right, thing. Right. And this whole period of time, like you just said, um, this period, which is known, I guess, as Reconstruction, which I think is interpreted as the country was reconstructing. But if you see Beloved, you realize that human beings were reconstructing themselves emotionally, psychologically, as they as they dared to go forward in the future. Yeah. And, and I think Tony, Tony's point, in part, is that those scars are very deep as you try to come to grips with the reconstruction for every individual. They're deep and abiding, yeah. <clears throat> and um, you know the the whole um, uh, exodus of of African American people from slavery, trying without any help from anybody to carve out a, a life for themselves, for their children, for subsequent generations. This is, is just such epic heroism that went on in this country, and it's so underreported. Um, and I love that Beloved um, throws a light and focuses in on these extraordinarily heroic, tormented by ghost people. You wanted to be as true to Tony's book as you could, to every detail, as much as you could. Yes. You know, we were so collectively inspired by that book <laughs> that um, we we had to honor it, even as we knew we had to to take flight from it. Right. Because, because you're making a movie. Yeah. But we we um, were we we all those of us who made the movie love the book. I mean, love the book. You want to hug that book and and keep it with you. And um, we we felt that um, that uh, we 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 didn't easily, ch we didn't change hardly anything. Uh, we couldn't use everything from the book, but we didn't make the frequent kind of little improvements that um, filmmakers often make on books yeah. when you go, you know, I know that uh, she, they, they're riding up in, in, in the book it says they're riding up in a Chevrolet in, uh, in red outfits, but wouldn't it be terrific if they arrived in a big black Cadillac and had on tuxedos? You know, that'd be much more visual, wouldn't it? We didn't do that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, we tried to be faithful to the kind of imagery that Toni Morrison was, was picturing her mind in the first place. All right, let me take a look. This is another excerpt from a conversation that we did with Oprah, which will appear later this week talking about Jonathan directing her. Here it is. My favorite Jonathan note is one day I'm in this chair, Seth is in the chair, <laughs> and the camera comes up behind my head, and, um, yeah. and, 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 and Beloved's going, bad Seth, bad, bad Seth. This is just before Denver opens the window and she sees the food. Yeah. And I was breathing in the chair. <sighs> So Jonathan keeps yelling, you know, he's outside with the megaphone going, give me less, give me less, it's still too much. And I finally yell back, Jonathan, I'm only breathing. And he <laughs> says, you know how you're doing? You're Just do the, no, huh. <laughs> okay. okay. A better breathe. A we'll better breathe. A better breathe. A better breathe. Out there are you, Mr. Demi? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Let me talk a little bit about the other characters here. You have the benefit of great, great actors. Yes, indeed. Danny Glover? Colton, you know more about their individual names than I do. Well, Danny yeah. Glover, Bea Richards. Yeah, who's fabulous. Oh, my God. Um, and Kimberly Elise and Tandy Newton and Lisa Gay Hamilton, who plays the younger Setha. And um, Albert Hall, who it played Stampede who is one of the great, great, great American actors. Um, I don't know if you remember him in, in Malcolm X, when, uh, when Denzel goes to, when Malcolm goes to prison, and uh, there's a guy who's, who kind of sets him straight yeah. and t tells him to clean up his oh, act. That's, right, 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 that's right, Albert right. Hall. Yeah. He's, he's a chameleon. He looks at, he, he's a completely different guy every time you see him in a movie. Was this experience different from other movie experiences? The, the making of the movie was different, um, very much so, because again, we had, you know, it's a, the, the, um, uh, we had a crew that was, um, it, it turned out to be um, aggressively multiracial, um, uh, and everybody there on the crew, certainly in the cast, just had very strong beliefs, a, a belief in, in the potential of, of racial harmony, um, but the upside of racial harmony. And um, felt that we felt that we had, were working on something that really had an opportunity to reflect things that we all cared passionately about, and this, we were in touch with that on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, this is a clip from the film from *Beloved*, in which Danny Glover playing the character Paul D uh, suggests moving, and Setha says no, and then the house starts to shake. Take a look at this. Clip. That child's half out of her mind. 
just say. The house is haunted. Yeah. There, there are ghosts there. I love that about the movie. <laughs> I love that. I believe in ghosts. Do you? No. <laughs> Do you really? I believe in spirits um, yeah. um, and that inhabiting. Inhabit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where does that come from in you? Well, I think one thing it comes from is as, as life goes on, and um, I mean, my, my, my grandmother, who's been dead for many years, she's, she's especially when I'm interacting with my kids, she's always in the room. Yeah. And um, I know my parents who have, um, have died, um, their spirits are around. And um, well, Maybe it's a question of definition then, because I mean, I think all of us carry um, our own experiences into whatever relationship, whatever, whatever we do or wherever we go. But I don't think of that as spirits as much as I think of that as just my history. Right. Although um, I They don't not... talk to me. Mm -hmm. Do they, they don't? talk to you? Um, I don't yeah. think so. I don't know. And I think Oprah is exactly where you are. I mean, talks to her. You know, I've, I've, having spent, I think having spent the time I have in Haiti helped to open me up because... I can imagine. Um, in Haiti, as in many cultures, in fact, right here, uh, the original Americans, the Native Americans, um, have, have days of celebration where the presence of the spirits is acknowledged. The whole idea of Day of the Dead, where you go to the, to the cemetery, not so much to mourn and leave flowers as we tend to do in our culture, but to go and party with the spirits. Commune. And, and celebrate. Yeah. Yeah, and have a good time. Um, uh, it's, uh, I think there's a lot to be said. You know, we, we, are we thinking about our ancestors because we're thinking about them? Is that some kind of psychological mechanism or what have you? Or, or is there something all pervasive about the human spirit which refuses to go away? Is it surprising that Jonathan Demme became a filmmaker? Um, yeah, it's, it, I became a filmmaker really through a series of flukes. I adored movies so much as a kid, right away. I remember seeing my first scene from a Hopalong Cassidy movie on my first uh, encounter with a television set and being instantly hooked. And then seeing movies like Treasure Island and just going all the time and all the time. And um, somehow or other, I had wanted to be a veterinarian, but I bombed out of chemistry <laughs> and I wound up writing movie reviews for the college paper. Yeah. But here's what they say about you, um, or what has been said about you, is that you kept a notebook that you, between the first movie you saw all the way through college, every movie you kept a little personal review as to when you saw it, who you saw it with, and what the movie was about, and whether you liked it or not. And, and a star rating. And a star rating. <laughs> You've been digging deep, haven't well, you? Well, <laughs> we've got some other stuff we want to talk about. So, so you get out, uh, you start my, making movie reviews. Your father is a publicist, yes? Yes, at the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami Beach. And then big Joe Levine comes down there yeah. from Embassy Pictures. And your father introduces you, and then you show him a review of his film Zulu. Is that fair story? Well, Mr. Levine told uh, my dad, oh, if your son's a critic, tell him to bring his reviews to the houseboat, which was moored across the street from the hotel. And I showed up one day with my little scrapbook of, of clippings, and he's flipping through. And I had, had favorably reviewed Zulu. And um, he literally, with a cigar in hand, poked it, told me, <laughs> you got good taste, kid. Yeah. Um, you, you like should, my movie, you, you got should good come taste. work with me. That's yeah. right. And um, uh, I, went into, uh, I, I went into the service for a while, came out and called up and he gave me a job and suddenly I was working in the movie business which was ridiculous. I, I couldn't believe that, that I could actually um, have a job no there. But there was no dream to be a director, was None it? None whatsoever. You were very happy to be a publicist. Oh yeah, I loved it. Um, and then I met Roger Corman and he was starting New World Pictures, and he needed scripts. And then Roger said to me, uh, well, Jonathan, you write these press releases and this production material. <laughs> you Why don't you write a motorcycle pictures. movie? <laughs> yeah, right. So I teamed up with my friend Joe Viola, who was yeah. the greatest storyteller I'd ever met. And we wrote a script, and we showed it to Roger. And he said, this is pretty good. Joe, you direct commercials, right? And Joe said, yeah. <laughs> Jonathan, uh, I'll tell you what. Joe, you direct it. Jonathan, you can yeah, produce it. Good. So suddenly, at, at, we're, you know, we're like 24 years old or something like that, and we're off to California to make our motorcycle movie. Um, Corman's great genius is he gave guys like you a chance to, for a hands-on experience. Well, that's, that's one of his great geniuses. I mean, Roger is truly one of the most extraordinary, amazing, um, great guys that you could ever come across. What makes him that? Uh, you know, it's the Oprah Winfrey thing, I think, a little bit. He's got tremendous enthusiasm 
and also a, a big ego and a desire to, to succeed. And um, he, I, I love about Roger, um, one of the many things, because he's, he's so quotable. And one thing he always used to tell the, the new directors when, when you'd start out with him, he'd say, you know, now listen, as a director, um, you're 40, 45% artist and 60 55% businessman. Never forget that. You've got to be a businessman. People are going to invest money in your movies, and you've got to repay that, that uh, investment. And, and as soon as you, you learn that maxim. He said, as soon as you let the, the arty part get carried away, you're going to find yourself <laughs> out of work. <laughs> when Silence of the Lambs came to you, um, did you have some sense that this, this movie was going to become what it did? I mean, did you know because of the Hopkins performance, because of Jody's performance, because of the script that you had there, that this had all the potential to be one of the classic American films the way it is? Um, I, I, was, I knew it had the potential to be a splendid movie. I knew that, that um, Ted Talley had written uh, an exceptional script from a great, 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 great book. Um, Tom Harris is, is such a, yeah. an extraordinary writer. And I knew we had a great cast. And I knew Tak Fujimoto was going to work his magic and everybody was going to do their thing. And I was confident we were going to have a terrific picture. But, you know, when you're making these things, all you know is that all I know is um, the one thing that, that my movies have in common is I've always been really excited by their potential as movies and a belief that that if we can make a movie that winds up exciting other people as much as the potential of it yeah. excites me maybe it'll be contagious you will read you'll make another sequel to that to um, silence of the lambs well the, 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 not Tom, sequel maybe that's the wrong word but um thomas harris is writing a new book he's been working on it a long time we're hoping that i'm hoping that it's going to be finished you know at some point before too long and i'm very much hoping to have an opportunity i know nothing about it we believe that dr lecter's a character um, we believe Clarice Strong is a, a character. By the way, we believe that because we want to believe it. Mm -hmm. Thomas Harris does not talk about his work in progress. But um, if he has done a, a new story featuring those characters, I think it's unlikely it'll be any, anything remotely like a straight sequel. I think he'll probably kind of go over there with it or something yeah. or other. I, don't, I just can't imagine. But you're but, prepared to make it. Oh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm dying to make it. Because? Because um, I love those characters, um, and it was uh, that that in its way was an th incredibly thrilling world to inhabit. And I love the idea of, you know, it goes back once again. You, you sometimes people ask me, well, well, what's what's the common link in your movies or what have you? The only common link in the movies for me is that I have loved the source material, and I've loved the source material because it's been, in my view beautifully written um, and whether that's the the humor of married to the mob for me or or the extraordinary um, human tapestry of beloved or or what Ron Nicewanner was wanting to say with his script for Philadelphia or Thomas Harris's vision of a certain kind of America um, here as we approach the millennium the writing has been exceptional um, and you know when you make a movie you got to live with these things for two years if you're the, the director um, it's a long process and it's got to continue to feed you and got to got to continue to interest you in order to be able to really kind of deliver something um, worthy of all that effort so anyway if Thomas Harris is I'd, I'd like to direct whatever Tom Harris wrote next time whatever it is whether, Hopkins is ready to go too isn't he yeah I believe so I think he is I think he's and safe. I believe Jody is as well I mean we're, we're all in makeup I'll put it that way <laughs> <laughs> but we've learned to be patient and uh, why so much time between movies for you um, Philadelphia was 1993 well that, yeah, there's, I guess two things one like I was um, just saying the the search for material that I can believe will I can make into a successful movie a movie that'll that'll both interest me and have the opportunity to reach the kind of audience that we hope beloved reaches um, is one thing and also Charlie I'm a late starting daddy I've got three kids oh. and um, uh, you know there's there's what am I gonna do this afternoon am I gonna go to the office or am I gonna try to get involved with these youngsters I'm, I'm you know it's it's um, I'm <laughs> I've got I've got plenty to do if I'm not making a movie and and again you know the, the search for a script is a, is a big big arduous task why is that so hard um I mean, there's so many stories you would think to tell, and the script is so crucial. I mean, mm -hmm. what, I mean why are there so few good scripts, I guess? And whenever you see one, frequently, not in this case, well, no, yes, in this case, in part, because 
Richard had to go off and make his own movie. Right. You had some additional work done on the script, correct? A, a lot. Adam yeah. Brooks came in, and right. we worked together on dozens of drafts. Um, it's a. Uh, it's just you're trying to shoehorn a lot into your your running time. I, I don't I don't know. I mean, it's it's just uh, are there I don't read that many books. Are there are there lots and lots of terrific books, or are most of them flawed significantly in one way or the other? I, I think they're more terrific books than they are movie scripts, right. evidently. Yeah. But again, you know, it's funny. I want to reference um, Rush Hour again, which which I saw, I saw and it. enjoyed to the hilt on Friday night. It was a a, a, a wonderful screenplay. Um, and maybe I don't. Was it written for for Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker? I I, I don't know. Um, but because their part, it's 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 a, a, a. Also, maybe there are a lot of great scripts that that didn't have the right casting. And I know there's a lot of terrific casts out there waiting for the right script. You can see that all over the. And a lot the, of talented performers. Yeah, a lot. I mean, we've got such a, an incredible array of acting talent um, available, and these scripts are there. It's hard. And you know why? I think also another thing is there's certainly. The um, the and I think it has to do with the, the financial imperative involved with making these movies. You know, they're they're expensive. They cost you know most of them a million and up, and um, uh, a, up. a lot of people uh, way way up, <laughs> and a lot of people wind up getting their 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 fingerprints all over what a script is be to reassure themselves that it's going to make money, and that often means making it as much like previous things that have done well as possible. This is a sad old song, but it's true. So you wind up, um, I think, you know, it's not as though we don't have a lot of gifted writers. We've just got an awful lot of, of people. Nervous executives. Executives, producers, filmmakers, Investors. actors, right. everybody. Right. You also like documentaries. I love them, yeah. You made a documentary about Talking Head, didn't you not? Well, that was a. I like to think of that as a as a rockumentary. Yeah. Okay. It was a, a performance film. Yeah. I'd made I've made some documentaries. I made I've made a couple in Haiti. I've made one about my cousin um, Robert Castle, who's an yeah. Episcopalian minister and a big troublemaker up on 126th yeah. Street in New York City. Would you? Can you imagine not making movies? I mean, what would you do if you didn't make movies? Uh, open a bookstore. <laughs> uh, I could do that. Maybe even open a movie theater and show movies. Um, but I love making films. And um, the joy uh, is what? Uh, one of the joys is getting to together with a whole community of extraordinarily gifted people, and and pooling your ideas and and your and your your uh, uh, efforts together um, with a collective goal of making something extremely special for people to to look at. It's it's very exciting that what goes on uh, on these these movie sets. I mean, it's just people who are phenomenal at what they do with, with a shared passion. Yeah. yeah. It's great to have you here. At Thank you. It's wonderful Jonathan. to be here. Thank you. Jonathan Demme, the movie is beloved uh, Oprah Winfrey and an extraordinary cast of people uh, based on Toni Morrison's, as all of you know, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning novel, a story uh, set in Cincinnati in 1873 with flashbacks to uh, both the horror of slavery and it is about ghost. It's about uh, sacrifices for love. It's about uh, so many subjects that uh, have, that are common to the human experience. Beloved the film, Jonathan Demme, the director. Back in a moment. Stay with us.